Would you look back again at 1 Corinthians chapter 10? Verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. What you're going through, everyone else is going through and has gone through. There's nothing unusual about your situation. But, God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Temptation. Is Paul saying that when you're tempted to commit a sin, and you know what that means, there's a sin that comes into your mind, you're struggling with, you know it's wrong, and you're tempted to commit that sin. He's, he's saying you've not been put in a place where you're unable <laughs> To resist that temptation because others have. Others have. You can as well. We can say no to temptation. God has made a way to escape it. You have the power to choose not to give in to that temptation. You can do that. God has made that available to you. And if you give in, you have nobody to blame but yourself. Well, I wouldn't deny that. I dare say every believer feels very uncomfortable with that because you know something of your weakness before temptation. You know, just the ability to be tempted shows how weak and sinful we are. Was the Lord ever tempted to commit a sin? No, no. Was he ever thinking, am I going to do it? Or am I not? Of course not. He is holy. He was incapable of committing a sin. But you and I know something about the power of temptation. Didn't the Lord teach us to pray? Lord, lead us not into temptation. I hope no one in this room thinks, well, I do pretty well with temptation. I'm I, I pretty much got that down. I know that's not the case with any believer. And so if I would look at that passage of Scripture, and I used to kind of get nervous whenever I read this because I would think of me being tempted to sin. Oh, how horrible sin is and how horrible being tempted to sin is and how horrible giving in to temptation is. It's a horrible thing. And every believer is dogged with this every single day of their life. What does this mean? I think of what Paul said in Galatians chapter 2. He said, if a brother be overtaken in a fault. Can you understand that? Can you understand a brother being overtaken, overcome? He said, there's no temptation taking you. Did you notice that? Taking you? Um, Ye which are spiritual, you which have the Holy Spirit, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest thou also be tempted, knowing whatever your brother would do wrong, you would too. And if you're put in the same position he was put in, you would fall like him. Consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. Now in our text, both the noun and the verb form of tempted is used. Notice he says, there hath no temptation taken you. That's the noun. And then we read, he will not suffer you to be attempted above that which you are able. That is the same word in the verb form. What does the word mean? And I know the first thing that comes to my mind is being tempted to sin. Oh, that's a horrible thing. 
being tempted to sin. Something comes up in your mind, you know it's wrong, you know it's evil, you know it's contrary to the scriptures, you know it's against the will of God, and you become uh, swept away with it, thinking about it. You can't get rid of it. You try to, uh, what a horrible thing that is. And everybody in here knows what I'm talking about. This thing of being tempted to sin. Now, the word does not necessarily mean that. Um, remember when James said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations? That's not saying count it all joy when you fall into temptation to sin. He's talking about all the trials God sends our way for our good and his glory. Count it joy when you fall into various temptations. This is talking about trials, testings, and difficult situations that God brings my way for my good and for his glory. Him who is too wise to err and too kind to be cruel, who always does what he does for the good of his people. This is what Peter referred to when he said, now if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. He's talking about trials and trials. They bring heaviness. Somebody says, well, I got through that trial easy. <laughs> it wasn't a trial then. If you go through a trial, you're going to find out how weak and how um, weak you are before that trial. And you're not going to think, well, I got through that well. I like the way Peter said, if need be. Whatever trial, whatever test the Lord sends my way and your way has a need be. Now, if need be, you're in heaviness, troubled through manifold temptations. What about when the Lord said um, to his disciples, you are they that continue with me in my temptations? He wasn't talking about being tempted to sin. The Lord was never tempted to sin. I love the fact that Christ could not sin. I just love that. I've heard preachers present, well, if, uh, if it was no temptation, there wasn't any righteousness in him turning it down. He was never tempted to commit a sin. He never committed a sin, nor did he think, oh, should I, I should not. That, that, he's God. If he could sin, that means he would change. He would be, not be immutable. He would not be faithful to who he is. The Lord Jesus Christ could not commit a sin. He wasn't tempted to sin in that sense, but oh, the temptations, the trials he had. Now, temptation can also be an enticement to sin, whether arising from inward desires, and you know what that means. It comes from you. It doesn't come from outside. It came from out of your wicked heart, my wicked heart, from inward desires or outward circumstances we are put in. Um, that's very real. And I would never say that these temptations... Uh, that are trials are ever separate from also the temptations to sin. Now, this verb form can also mean to examine, to test, to prove, and it can be to tempt one to commit evil. Like Satan tempted the Lord. He sought to seek to tempt him to sin. Now, whether... This is talking about simply the trials, the temptations that the Lord sends our way, and we, we, we have them. I mean, there's so many. They're so varied. Uh, they're coming our way. And if you're not in one now, it's coming. And if you're coming out of one, you're going to go be coming back into one. I mean, that's just the way it is, and that's what we need, if need be. The Lord is merciful, but even during those trials, you can't separate that from the temptation to commit sin in so many different ways. Now, in the context of this, he's talking about the sin of idolatry. Look what he says in verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. He's talking about the sin of idolatry. And that is involved in all the things that he's been talking about in these first 10 verses of the different um, trials that the children of Israel had gone through. But I want you to turn with me to 1 John chapter 2 for a moment.
First John chapter two. Verse 15. John says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, before I go on, there's things in this world we love. We love God's creation. We love the blessings he brings our way. We love many things, and well, we should. So he's not saying hate everything in the world. There's many things we're very thankful for, many things. So what is he talking about? He says in verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The lust of the flesh the lust of the cravings of sinful, fallen flesh. Now, it's pointed out before the fall that Adam and Eve were both naked and they were not ashamed. It was not an issue because they did not have a sinful nature. Uh, If I didn't have a sinful nature and you didn't have a sinful nature, the thought of nakedness would not be an issue. It's not be something that would create lust and temptation and so on. But... Because of a sinful nature, what's the first thing they did? They knew they were naked. They were ashamed, all the things that came with that. And they went and hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. The lust of the flesh is the cravings of sinful, fallen nature. Somebody says, I can't help it. It's natural to me. That doesn't make it okay. That doesn't make it less sinful. It's the the cravings of a sinful, fallen nature. And then he talks about the lust of the eyes. Uh, What's the difference between the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh? Well, the lust of the eyes is being concerned about what others think of you, about what others see. It's being more concerned about what men think of you than what God thinks of you. The lust of the eyes, the pride of life, uh, the pride of, of accomplishment and achievement and power and look what I've done. Uh, the pride of life, i heard it described like this, the lust of the flesh, pleasure, the lust of the eyes, popularity, the lust of, or the pride of life, power. Um, This is actually what the Lord used, or what Satan used with Adam and Eve. You remember when that fruit was brought before them and the fruit was pleasant to the eyes, the lust, I mean, uh, yeah, pleasant to to, I can't remember exactly what it says, but it was pleasant and then it was good to look upon. There's the lust of the eyes. And a tree desired to make one wise. There's the pride of life, these three things. And when Satan tempted the Lord after being uh, fasting for 40 days, he said, command that this stone be made bread. There's the lust of the flesh. It had something to do with his flesh, satisfying his flesh. Command that this stone be made bread. And then he said, if you're really the son of God, jump off the pinnacle of the temple and prove it to us. Give us something we can see that will prove this is real. That's the lust of the eyes. And then he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said, all these will I give to you. For it's given to me to do this if you'll just bow down and worship me. There is the pride of life. And I love the way the Lord said, the prince of this world had come and he's found nothing in me. How much does he have to work with, with me and you? A whole lot. He had nothing to work with, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, back to our text, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Whether he's talking about trials, which I think that's what he's talking about, uh, but you can't separate that from being tempted to sin. I mean, because when you're going through a trial, you're tempted to unbelief, you're tempted to some kind of sin, you're 
tempted to something, but listen to what he says. There hath no temptation taken you. That's strong language. Taken you, but such as is common to man. You're not going through anything anybody else hadn't already gone through. Whatever it is. And you know there's an element of comfort to that. Uh, What you've gone through, um, everybody else has. Uh, The temptations you faced, everybody else has. Uh, You're not going through anything that's not common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, it doesn't say he's going to get rid of that temptation or that trial, but he'll with it uh, give you a way of escape that you might be able able to endure and bear it. Now, what is the way of escape? The gospel. The gospel. Now, this is not a message on how to resist temptation. I wish I could tell you how to resist temptation. I wish I could tell myself how to resist temptation. I wish I could never be tempted again to sin. I I wish that. You wish that. Uh, But is this a, a, a how to resist temptation? No, this is the way of escape. He'll provide you a way of escape. Now, what came to my mind is Paul's thorn in the flesh. That would give us some understanding of what's going on in this thing of temptation. Uh, What was that thorn? Was it a trial? Well, he had plenty of those. Was it some sickness in his flesh. And some have thought that because he said to the Galatians, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. And perhaps he had severe problem with his eyesight. But I have a tendency to think it's not um, just a sickness or a a problem like that because you can get those physical problems. There are trials, there, there are troubles, there are grievous. I realize that. But when he talks about a thorn in the flesh, Maybe he's talking about sickness. We're not really told. But a thorn in the flesh. A thorn that had something to do with his flesh. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure... Through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me. Who gave it to him? God did. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, to him. Smite me in the face to bruise me black and blue. Now, this was Paul's experience. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Oh, a thorn in the flesh is so painful. There was given to me by God a thorn in the flesh to buffet me, to smite me in the face, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Now does that mean he only asked the Lord three times for it to depart? No, it means I asked all the time. I asked all the time. Let this thorn depart from me. Let it be gone. It's making my life miserable. Let it be gone. Now what brought on this um, passage where the Lord ended up saying, my grace is sufficient for thee. Let me say, that's the way of escape. That is the way of escape. My grace is sufficient for thee. But let's look up in verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. It's not a good thing Doubtless for me to glory. You know, the scripture says, he that glorieth, let him glory. 
in the Lord. But if you're put in the position of the Apostle Paul, you might have a tendency of glory. Let's see why. He said, I will come to visions and revelations in the Lord. And Paul came to a lot of visions and revelations. Uh, he tells us in a little bit about how he was caught up into the third heavens and heard unspeakable words, which were not lawful for a man to utter, where he was taught the gospel by Jesus Christ directly without the use of a man. Now, if I was brought up into heaven and the Lord communicated the gospel directly to me, um, I may have a tendency to think, I got something they don't have. Should I? Of course not. Would I? Yeah, because of my sinful self. And Paul was aware of that. Now look what he said. Now he says, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. He had many times. Now look, I love the way he says this in verse 2. He said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows how he was caught up into paradise. And he heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Now look at the way he says this. He says, I knew a man in Christ. The humility. The only way I can even think of this man is this man being in Christ. I, this wouldn't have happened to me. I wouldn't have been given these revelations that I've been given teaching me the gospel if it were not simply for this one glorious fact, I'm in Christ. I don't even want to think about anything apart from being in Christ. And Paul actually is speaking with humility. I knew a man in Christ. Now here's my confidence in Christ. Of him. Are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption? I am all of that in Christ. Now, Paul said the only way he could have brought me up into the third heavens, if he did, in fact, it's something that happened 14 years ago. And I thought that was interesting. 14 years. 14 years ago is 2010, and I was thinking about this. I can't remember anything that took place in 2010. You say, what took place in 2010? I have no idea. 14 years ago is a long time ago, but this is how long ago this happened, but he remembered this. I was brought up into the third heavens. I knew a man in Christ. He hath made us accepted in the beloved Oh, that I may win Christ and be found in him. Isn't that the desire of your heart? And Paul said, I wouldn't have any of this experience except I were in Christ. I knew a man in Christ, verse 2, above 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I can't tell, or whether out of the body. I don't know if this was a vision uh, or whether I was somehow caught up out of my body and brought into heaven, my soul, my spirit. I can't tell. I don't know. God knows. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And that's a powerful thought. There's the atmosphere, the blue skies, the nighttime, the clouds where the birds fly. There's the second heaven, outer space, the galaxies. The third heaven where Christ dwells. Where God dwells. Where the angels live. Where the seraphims fly around his throne, crying holy, holy, holy. The third heavens. I don't know if I was there bodily or whether my soul rose up out of my body, but there I was in the third heavens. Hearing unspeakable words which are not lawful for a man to utter. Turn with me to Ephesians. Hold your finger there and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 1. 
For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you. Now the reason I was brought up into the third heavens is for you. Do you know that although Paul was taught the gospel directly, you've been taught the same things Paul was. He brought them to you in this word. God the Holy Spirit made it known, but everything that was revealed to Paul is revealed to all of his children. If you know the gospel, God has revealed these glorious things to you. And Paul says, when I was up there, I heard unspeakable words. I don't know what language he heard. Somehow he had to bring it down to us, but I heard unspeakable words which were not lawful for a man to utter. Verse 3, Ephesians chapter 3, how by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now, a mystery is that which we could have never known had not God been pleased to make it known. Would you ever know that God is one God in three persons except he made it known? Would you have ever known of the glorious atonement and achievements of Christ had he not made them known? Would you ever have known the work of the Holy Spirit in the new birth had he not made it known? You wouldn't know these things. But he made them known whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. That's how I know these things. God made them known to me. And this was communicated to him in unspeakable words, which are not lawful for a man to utter. And this is how Paul became the wise master builder. That's what he called himself. I as a wise master builder. He said in Galatians 1.12, the gospel which was preached to me was not after man. I didn't have Peter teaching me. I didn't have John teaching me. I didn't have any of the apostles teaching me. I didn't come up with it on my own. The gospel which was preached to me was not after man, for I needed to receive it of man, nor was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we believe the gospel Paul preached. And that means if I believe the gospel Paul preached, God revealed to me the same things He revealed to Paul. So don't get too jealous of Paul. He's revealed the same things to you and I. Now Paul says in verse 5, Of such a one will I glory, that man in Christ. Of such a one will I glory. I'm so thankful to be in Christ. I'm so thankful God put me in Christ. I'm so thankful for the revelation that there is in Christ. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself. I will not glory, but in my infirmity. My weakness. Now, when you think of your flesh, what do you think of? Weakness. Weakness. Somebody says, not me, I'm strong. Well, you're blind as a bat then. Weakness. Now look what he says in verse 6. For though I would desire to glory... I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Now, if you knew a man had been brought into the third heavens and came down and was talking to you, you'd be impressed with that man. If you were that man, you would, uh, you know, you, you ought to be humbled that the Lord would do something like that with you. But you know, you'd glory. If I, if I brought, if I was brought into the third heavens, I'd come down and I'd think, hmm, the Lord's really blessed me in an unusual way. Um, I'm here to dispense the wisdom He's given me to these ignorant masses. You know, that's. I mean, that's that's just so. That's how we are sinful. Stupid, self-righteous, always ready to glory in something other than Christ. It's so evil. But what did the Lord do for Paul? He says, verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. 
What a temptation that must have been. I don't know what it is. You don't know what it is. But Paul called it the messenger of Satan. And he said, it's me getting struck with the fist of Satan in the face, beating me black and blue. And every time that I feel how exalted I am, this is given to me to bring me back down to earth real quick. What a trial, what a temptation that was. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now for this thing, this thorn in the flesh, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Oh, I want it gone. I want it to leave. It beats me black and blue. I hate it. And I asked the Lord, make this to go away. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My grace. Now, his grace is sovereign grace. You know what that means? He can give it to you. He can give it to you because he's sovereign. He can give it to you. You can't say, well, it can't be for me. He can give it to you because it's sovereign grace. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. My grace, it's free grace. There's nothing you need to pay to have it. There's nothing you need to do to have it. It's free grace. It's always saving grace, and it's sufficient grace. I love that word, sufficient. My grace is sufficient for thee. Now, here Paul is, beat black and blue with his thorn in the flesh, and what is his way of escape? He'd ask the Lord to take it away. The Lord didn't. The Lord didn't say no. He didn't say no. You're stuck with it. He gave him this answer. My grace is sufficient for thee. Now, I love thinking about the sufficiency of his grace. Let's say you do have a thorn in the flesh. Can your thorn in the flesh prevent his electing grace? Oh, don't you love electing grace? His sovereign choice of his people without reference to anything in them simply because he's sovereign and he would. His redeeming grace, can your thorn in the flesh, whatever that may be, can it take away from the power of his redemption? His redeeming grace, the, uh, the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, can your... Can your thorn in the flesh, whatever it might be. I don't know if it's a trial. I don't know if it's, it's a struggle in the flesh with something. Everybody's got their struggles in the flesh. I, I know they do. Every, we, we keep them hid as much as we can. You don't want them to get out. But everybody's got their, their weaknesses, their sinfulness, their sinful capacities that they struggle with. Can that present, prevent God's grace from saving you? No, it can't. Because his grace is always saving grace. It can't, it can't prevent him from giving you life. It can't prevent him from preserving you. It can't prevent him from glorifying you, whatever that is. Can you rest in this? And I, you know, I'm, I, it, it's almost to, for him to, I try to put myself in Paul's place, for him to say, my grace is sufficient for you. It is. It really is. I don't need anything else. Oh, my sufficiency is in him, the sufficiency of his saving grace. My grace is sufficient for you. That's your way of escape. You don't need anything else. My grace is sufficient for you. Are you content to be saved by grace alone? Answer that in your own heart. Are you content? Are you satisfied 
to be saved by grace alone. He said in verse 9, my grace is sufficient for thee. Nothing else is needed. Nothing you need to do. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know, Paul goes on to say, when I'm weak, then am I strong. You know, when you're strong, you're so weak. You don't realize it, but you're in utter weakness when you feel, I'm strong. No, you're not. I tell you, when you are strong, when you're nothing but weakness itself, that's when you understand my grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength, my strength is made perfect in weakness. It doesn't operate where there's strength to compete with it. His grace only operates in utter and complete weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Now, does that mean that he enjoys the thorn in the flesh and glories in it? No, but he does glory in what it teaches him about himself. And it teaches him about the sufficiency of God's grace. So I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then am I strong. You see, when you're weak, you're nothing. When you're nothing, Christ is all. What is this way of escape? Turn back to our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. There hath no temptation, trial, trouble, sickness, temptation to sin. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You're not going through anything Nobody else has ever gone through. This is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able? But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it, bear up under it. And what is the way of escape? My grace is sufficient for thee. May the Lord enable us all to glory in that. My grace is sufficient for thee. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you that your grace your saving, free, glorious grace is sufficient. Lord, enable us to glory only in the man in Christ. Our salvation is being in him. And Lord, enable us to be weak so we might have your strength. Bless this message for Christ's sake. In his name we pray.